Good morning, Hope Chapel. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, my name is Neil Davidson, one of the pastors here at Hope Chapel. It's great to welcome you to our services and also to welcome to those who are joining us online. Whenever you're joining us online, it's great to have you with us this morning. So, hey, I just want to do a couple of small little things up front and then we'll get into our message for today. I want to peel the onion back just a little bit. I think sometimes there are great things that are happening through Hope Chapel that you guys have no idea is going on. And it's always hard for us to find the right venues to communicate that stuff because you don't always read everything that we email to you, right? And that kind of good stuff. So, um, so through the giving channels that Hope Chapel has through our regular budget and some other kinds of gifts, there are a couple things that are happening right now that, that you may not be aware of. One, um, <clears throat> we are having a hand right now in revitalizing a school in Gassini, which is in Rwanda. Uh, it, this is a school that's K through 12th grade, and the government was going to close it because the facilities were inadequate by their standards. And so we've been able to resource them to, re, to redo this school building. So they've already done one section, now they're doing the majority of it, and then when the kids take their next break a little later in the year, they'll finish the project. And all of that is happening because Hope Chapel, you know, we prayed about this for a couple of years and then God just kind of provided the resources for this to happen. It's great stuff. The other is um, we have a church in our area, uh, the First Baptist Church of Marlboro, uh, that just recently the, the, the ancient church agreed to merge with the new church that was being planted in Marlboro. And the two have come together and they're really working on trying to fix up a neglected building. And so we've been able to make a contribution towards their revitalization effort towards their building. Not a huge one, but they were covering most of the expense themselves, but we've been able to add to that just a little bit to get them a little closer to their goal so they can get their building kind of up to snuff so that they can use it as a great tool to do ministry. And all that stuff is kind of happens behind the scenes, and, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and it's good stuff. I mean, the impact that Hope Chapel is having is just... It's amazing for a small church planted in a, in a small town. It's really good stuff. But secondly, we want to bring that impact just a little bit closer to home. And so we have some people in our church who have this harebrained idea, which I think is a good one, to start a community garden. All right? And so part of what we want to do is we want to reclaim part of the field that's out here to my left, your right, that when we moved in was, was just grass, and now we have 20-year scrub growth. And, and so we want to reclaim anywhere, about a third of an acre, give or take a little bit, out on this side. So we need some guys who haven't used their chainsaws in a while that want to come out and help us and, uh, on a day. And we don't know exactly when we're going to do that yet, but we're going to try to get on top of that. And then we need to find a way to chip it up, burn it up, stick it in people's trunks, do whatever. We'll get rid of all that stuff. And then, we, and then we'll work through all getting the stumps out, and we, but we need to stay on top of that. So if you're, if you're interested in lending a hand whenever we do that, whether it's a, you know, now we can work from 5 to 7 at night, right, and, and that kind of thing. If you're open to helping out with that, you can either just shoot me a text, shoot me an email. You can just write it down on a card. Just don't tell me verbally when you're walking out the door because I will make you a guarantee. I will forget. All right. So you can use one of the cards that's there in front of you, whatever. And obviously, as we're getting close to planting season, we want to kind of get on top of this quickly. So it's something that we would be doing in the next few weeks. So if you can lend a hand with that, we'd love for you to be a part of that. All right. Enough with that stuff. Let's get into our, our, our message for today. You know, um, I, I tell our elders when they come on as, uh, on our, onto our elder team, one of the most important things that they do as an elder, you know, there's all kinds of management stuff and decision making. The most important things that they do is stand alongside me and the staff and help us how to figure out how we're going to mix love and truth together as a congregation. Let me say, let me say that again. How we're going to mix love and truth together as a congregation. There's some churches that have gone way to one side, and it's all about love. And in some ways, they've lost their grip on the truth. There's other people who have a really hard grip on truth, but they come across as very mean-spirited, unforgiving, and judgmental. And so one of the greatest challenges that we have is to figure out how we as a congregation are going to incarnate the love of God, which we're going to be talking about today, 
and the truth that God has revealed to us as we live it out in the world. And this has been a challenge for the church for a long time. I mean, the, the medieval church was not known as a very loving place in a lot of ways. And, and, and there's a lot of explanations for that from the harsh context and all that kind of thing. I think some of it was the orality of their people. Most of the people didn't read, so all they remembered was the stories. And there's a lot more mean stories in the Bible sometimes than there are nice stories in the Bible, if you know what I mean. The Good Samaritan kind of gets weighed out by a lot of David and Goliath and those kind of thing. And so it was hard for them. But I think there's a way as well as, 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 as believers, we kind of get... It's very easy for us to look at faith just through our own perspective. And, and, and it creates some challenges for us. So we have a tendency, if we want to, to want to wrap our faith in, in, in the flag of our nation, if you will, right? We look at the world through our own views as we've adopted it from our culture. And that kind of, so, for example, right, you know, in America, we, we would often take our Christianity. And we would use it as an undenying foundation for our individuality and our personal liberty. But I got to tell you, there's many places in the world that that doesn't resonate at all. You know, one of the things we're learning about Rwanda is that we, we really see life through our individual things and our nuclear families. It's me, my spouse, and my two kids, right? And in and, 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 and many cultures of the world, including Rwanda, they see it through a clan mentality. For example... Yesterday, Christina and I had the privilege of meeting the young woman that our Rwandan son, Arthur, is going to marry, and they're going to get married here in the States in December, but today, her, her family and, and his parents, now when I say her family, her parents are in Dallas where she lives, so her aunts and uncles are in Kigali meeting with Arthur's parents, and they are planning the wedding and how it's all going to go. It's why people will, will, will take their child and give it to a sibling if they're in a place that can provide a better, better thing. Because they're still a part of the family, even though they're not at home with the parents. It's a very different, and, we, and, and I think our world often, not only do we have this tendency to want to wrap you know, our, our world perspective and our faith, which really makes that challenge of love and truth very difficult, but on top of that, the world often wants to back us into a corner where the only thing that we think we can talk about is those things that we are against and not what we are for. And that's part of what's been going on in the cultural wars for us as a church, really since the 1970s, right? The, the world keeps pushing the boundaries of what is moral and ethical, and we feel like the only voice that we have is to talk about the fact that that's not right. And so we're expressing what we're known, what we're, we're, we're against. And I don't think we can back off of that, but we also have to find our voice for what we are for. We have to mix love and truth. And I think it's really interesting on the last night of Jesus' life, there's probably no theme that he came back to over and over again with his disciples than the concept of love. And I'd love for you to grab your Bibles and turn to John, the Gospel of John with me. If you're using one of our Bibles, it's up underneath your seats. On, and uh, um, there's a Bible there for you to use. And that, our text today is 956, 957, right, somewhere right in there. John is the fourth of the four Gospels. And he was one of the inner circles of, with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. You know, he's one of those inner circles. And as far as we know, he was the longest living apostle, meaning that of the original 12, he was the last one alive so he was the last one got to enjoy his kingdom treasures that he had been laying up for all those years. And, and what we're going to see again is like Jesus is like a parent who is kind of speaking to their kids over and over again about what they want them to remember when they're home for the first time alone, right? The instructions, he, he talks about it, he talks about it again, he talks about it again. There's a, a, a commentator that I read quite a bit, Gerald Borchard, who was the who was a longtime New Testament professor at Southern Seminary, and he's written a commentary, two-volume commentary on the Gospel of John, and he talks about like Jesus is like working through to a bullseye. And so he, he talks about some things, and he comes back to it. And we've seen this already about service and prayer, and except we're going to keep working, but he keeps moving through, and he finally kind of brings it down to a bullseye. And we're going to see a little bit of that today. And I want to do the same thing I did last week. I want us to look at some of the main teachings that Jesus has about love, right? And 
then I, and then I want to back up and, and try to make some observations that kind of pull it all together for us. And, and let me warn you, my goal today, because I, I, I think it's just beyond the realm of possibility, right? My goal today is not to answer all of your questions and what it means to be a loving Christian. I am going to try to develop a deep, residing conviction in your heart to ask that question. How am I truly being a loving Christian? So let's start. We're going to be in John chapter 13 to start. John chapter 13. And I'm going to read verses 34 and 35. So again, Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet, including Judas's. He knows Judas is going to betray him, and yet he still performs a task on his feet that nobody would have expected Jesus, let alone anybody else in that room, to actually perform. And when he moves to the end, this is what he says in verse 34 and verse 35. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one, if you love one another or have love one for another. Now, this, this passage has a lot of great stuff in it. I want to ask the first question, what is new about this command? I mean, the command to love is not new at all. I mean, you can just work your way through the Gospels, and you know that Jesus over and over again affirmed that the fact that the two greatest commandments were love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So what in the world is he saying, right? I mean, in the Gospel, you know, he has an encounter with a rich young ruler who comes to him and says, Lord, you know, what good thing must I do? to have eternal life. And Jesus said, well, what, what do you think God has said to you? You know, what, what does the word say? And, he, and he's ticking off, not steal, not lie, not commit murder, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered well, right? I mean, he affirms this love. When Jesus was, was um, they sought to kind of box Jesus into a corner and have something to condemn him about. Some Pharisees came to him very late in his ministry and said, well, which is the greatest commandment? Which is the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So how does he get off in John chapter 13 saying he's given us a new command? I mean, this has been around for centuries. I mean, it was ingrained in the culture of the people of God that one of the biggest things that God expected them to do was to love their neighbor as themselves. So what's new? And, and so here's how I would respond to that. It's not the command to love that's new, but it's the standard of love that's new. Let that sink in for a minute, right? It's not the command to love. He says, I give you a new command, love one another. That's been around for a long time. But then he continues with, says, just as I have loved you. That's the new standard. Just as I have loved you. Love one another, right? And that's the, that's the, 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 the point that comes out for us, right? I give you a new, new command. Love one another. Just as I loved you, you are to love one another. And then he goes on to point out the fact that when you do this, it's going to have a revelational value. People are going to be able to see that you've been with Jesus, that you walk with Jesus because of the way you love other people. So this is the example Right? The command is to love other people in the same way that Jesus has loved us. And let me just tick off a couple of things to maybe spur your conversation down the road as you, as you think about what does this mean, right? Because, listen, it, it involves a lot of small stuff, but lo the, the, love, the example of love that Jesus set for us does not stop with bringing cookies to the new neighbors down the street. Somehow or another, it goes beyond that just a little bit, right? It goes a little further. Here's a couple of things. The first thing when we look at it is that Jesus chose to love. It wasn't just a feeling. It wasn't just a reaction, but he chose to love. In fact, 
In John chapter 15, in these chapters that we're looking at as a part of this closing council piece, Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. He chose to love them, right? He chose them to be one of his apostles. They, he chose them to be a part of that core, but he chose to love them. And love for us has to be a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not a task, right? It is a choice that we make. Secondly, the thing I tell you is that the kind of love that he has for the disciples and for us and the examples that he's setting for us to follow is that this is the type of love that, is, that, that the recipient does not deserve it or merit it. It's an undeserved love. It's not to look at it and say, you know, well, you know, th- th- boy, this person's really trying. I think I'll give them a hand. <laughs> Get up. You know, like, it's, it, you know, it, it, where there's a sense of merit or whatever. You know, what does the scripture tell us? For God so loved the world. What has Jesus been saying about the world in, in, in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16? The world hates me. The world's trying to kill me. The world is going to kill me. Yet God so loved the world. It's not deserved. It's not merited, right? And, and that's the hard part for us. Because it's, you know, even Jesus said, you know what? It's easy for the world to love those who love them, right? The world, the world doesn't have any problem taking care of its own, right? That's why in some ways, the, you know, the, quote, unquote, out there in the world, there are lots of good people. They make great neighbors and good colleagues and coworkers and friends and et cetera. That's not the point. It's easy, if you will, to, to bless others who are blessing you. He says, I, I'm looking for you to go out. What I'm doing is I'm blessing those who can never bless me. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. And one last piece I want to put into this, and then we'll continue with our conversation, a couple other scriptures, is that it's proactive. It's not just a reaction, but it's, it's, but it's proactive. Jesus is actually seeking ways... Just a tidbit, and this is taken a little bit of out of com- context, but you notice when, when Jesus is, is walking through the crowd and the woman who's been struggling with a hemorrhage for, for, for years and years and years reaches out and touches his garment and is healed, Jesus actually notices and he stops and he says, oh, 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 oh. And, who, and he initiates the contact that he can bless her through, right, to connect with. He's proactive. He's aware of what's going on around him, who's around him, and he is actually making the deliberate choice. We're going to come back to some of that pieces as we move along. What's new is the standard that we're being called to love. There's always been a command to love one another, to love your neighbor, but Jesus is setting a new standard for that. I am asking you to love one another in the way that I have loved you. Let's go on to the next passage. We're going to go over to John chapter 14. And now, in all honesty, we're we're going to look at verse 21, just a single verse. We could have parked in verse 15 as well in John chapter 14. This is part of Jesus kind of coming back to everything over and over again. Because in verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And you could follow through in verse 23 where he also says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. But we're going to plop down and just look at verse 21 because it kind of pulls those two areas together. You know, part of this is just a reminder to us that just because we know something doesn't mean we shouldn't be reminded of it. Jesus says it. Says it again, it says it again, right? And sometimes like, oh, I've heard all that stuff before. You know, when the pastor comes up with something new that I've never heard of, tell me and I'll come back. You know, I, we, we need to be hearing this stuff over and over again. But look at verse 21. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will also love him And reveal myself to him. Now, to many of us, what Jesus says here sounds almost, it it sounds contradictory. Love doesn't demand. Love doesn't constrain. Right? Love doesn't say, you know what, you you know, if you want to be my friend, you got to do everything I tell you to do. That's, That's kind of the way we sometimes look at this. Right? 
Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And if you want me to love you back, if you want the Father to love you back, you better do everything that we tell you to do. Right? And that's the way we kind of look at it. And, and that doesn't look like love. That looks like control. That's not the spirit of it at all. That's not the spirit of it at all. And so we, it's part of that. We just have to take it, spin it, get the laces off, and punt that idea, and just get it out of our minds and go in a different direction. Because this is what Jesus is really talking about. He, he, he's talking about the fact that, that, that in order for us to be enjoying the love of God and enjoying his love and basking in it, there has to be a sense of alignment between our hearts and our minds. Right? That, that, that part of it is that we want what he wants. And that's an, that, and that's a, an expression of our love. Is that, you know, that, that we bring ourselves along into alignment so that what, what Jesus has asked us to do and who he's asked us to be, that's actually what we want in our hearts. So it's not a task to be done, but it is a desire to be fulfilled that we can actually be who he is. So the one who obeys me, the one who wants what I want, is the one who's actually in a position to really love me and to also experience all the love that comes from the Father. And, and so there's this, this kind of this... Um, synergy, if you will, that goes on between our heart and our mind, and that, that we, we want what we know is consistent with the character of God is actually what we want from our hearts. That's our passion, the mission of our lives. And so, you know, so here, here's, the, here's, here's the, the, you know, trying to make this somewhat tangible so you can get your fingers on it, right, and get a handle with it. Then, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, all right, well, I've done my service project for God now, and now I can go out and do what I want. But it's like, wow, God has allowed me to engage in the service project, and that's what makes my weekend great. Do you see the difference? Like, like, like when people, when, so I'll, I'll make a point. When somebody's thinking, all right, how am I going to use my three weeks of vacation this year? And the first thing they said, well, you know what? I want to make sure that I set aside vacation Bible school week so I can serve. That's the very first thing I want to do. And then I'll figure out the rest of it from there. Right? I mean, that's the kind of shift, right? It's just like, oh, you know what? You know, if it works out, I'll do it. But I got other stuff I really like to do with my vacation. Kind of, you know, you know it says it, it's, we want. It's, it's what we want. What brings him joy is what brings us joy. And because of that, what we want to do and who we love, those things come into alignment because the same things that bring him joy are the same things that bring us joy. And, and, and I got to tell you, I think there's a lot of ways in which too many believers today are paying the rent in their faith so they can go out and live like they'd like to. And this is a challenge to us. He says, if anybody loves me, you know, you know notice there's the love towards towards others and there's the love towards God. That's the dynamic that we always live in, right? Those two relationships. And he says, if you love me, the, the one who loves me and, keep, and has my commands and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. And when you and I do that, you and I are actually going to be able to experience the love of God more fill, fully in our lives. It's, it's like God's trying to pour himself into us and we just keep opening up the lid wider and wider and wider so more can get in at a time. One more passage to look at, and it's in, in John chapter 15, and, and, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 17. You're only going to see 9 down to about 14. It's going to jump to the, the last phrase, but again, Jesus is, is just saying, as the fathers loved me, I have also loved you, and that's how he's asking us to love one another. So God's already gone before. God's not asking you to do anything that he's not willing to do and hasn't already done. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. We're going to talk about abiding in Christ next week, and it comes out of the early part of, of chapter 15 in the vine and the branches. It says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands so again, he's asked us to obey him, and he said, I've already modeled that for you because I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things. 
so that my joy may be in you. Because whenever you and I are not living in the fullness of God's love, our joy is being minimized, period. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command, and this is going to sound very familiar. Love one another (laughs) as I have loved you. No one has greater life than this than to lay down his life for his friends. We're going to come back to that phrase. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything I have heard from the Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. We just talked about that. I appointed you to go and produce fruit that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. We're going to talk about prayer in a couple of weeks. This is what I command you. Love one another. Now, there's a lot of stuff to process out of this passage of of Scripture as we go through, right? And and here Jesus is clearly offering him the way he's loved, not only in the past, but what he's about to do the very next day as as the example for the way we're supposed to love. But what what really comes back to us is, what does it mean for you and I to love other people in such a way that we're ready to lay down our life for our friends? Again, I'm not trying to answer all the questions. I'm trying to start the conversation. <laughs> I'm trying to, right? He said, I've given you an example. And you know what? And here, here, here's the mountaintop. If you want to climb all the way to the peak, the place you're going to get is that you're willing to lay down your life for your friends. And so Jesus clearly does that, correct? I mean, the very next day, he's going to be arrested, and the innocent is going to die in the place of the guilty. Not only Jesus dying in the place of Judas, uh, of, of, of Barabbas, I mean, but Jesus actually dying in the place of all sinners because he who, became, who knew no sin, the scripture tells us, he actually became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. He's, he's actually going to lay down his life for all of his friends. Not, and, and, and he's going to, so the, the, the one who deserved and had earned and merited righteousness because he was righteous actually dies as a sinner in the place of everybody else. He lays down his life for his friends. What does that mean for us? And, and let me start off from, I don't know completely. I don't know completely. I mean, as a part of it, you say, we should be ready to make any sacrifice to meet the needs of people. But some of that doesn't make any sense when you push it too far. Right? I mean, there's a lot of need in the world right now. I could empty out my retirement accounts, sell my house, dedicate my future salary, send all that money out the door, and I would be homeless and penniless, and there'd still be a ton of need in the world. Is that what God's really asking me to do? So far, not so. He's asking me to serve. What what does it really mean? Right? And I'm... And, and, and like I said, I, I, the, the very first thing is I think we have to be at least asking the, conver- asking the question, having the conversation with God. Am I loving other people in a sacrificial way? But uh, I do have a couple thoughts, right, that I want to throw in here, right? You know, in, in that somewhere along the line, loving other people the way Jesus has loved us And laid down his life for us means somewhere along the line, our love of other people means that we have to set aside our personal rights. Can't answer that question for you. It's my responsibility to answer that question before God. But somewhere along the line, Jesus didn't need, he didn't have to die. He wasn't guilty. But he laid aside his personal rights for us. I don't know what that exactly looks for us, like for us. There's somewhere along the line saying, you can't, you can't expect me to, and yet somehow we're saying, I'm going to do that anyways. And, 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 and I don't know what that all looks like. Some of it, it means that at the end of the day, sometimes fairness doesn't come into play. We just love even though it's unfair. It wasn't fair that Jesus died for what you and I and everybody else who ever took a breath on the planet did. It wasn't fair fact, it wasn't even just, but it was loving. 
And somewhere in the midst of that, fairness has to come into play. And, and again, those are conversations that you all have to have for yourself. You know, there's, there's actually in somewhere in there it, it, where the world needs to look at it and say, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. There has to be an unreasonableness to it. I mean, that's one of the biggest dynamics that the disciples said. It doesn't make any sense to them that the Messiah somehow doesn't raise an army and throw off the Romans and conquer all. It, it just doesn't make sense to them somehow. And yet somewhere in the midst of this, the way that we love the world and accomplish God's plan, it somehow it just doesn't make sense. There, there, there has to be an unreasonableness to it. Okay. All right. I'm running out of time. Let me try to summarize a few things for us very quickly. <laughs> very quickly, right? I've hammered on this first point a lot. So let me just kind of lay it out there and, and make a couple things. The standard of Christian love, what God is asking us, to seek his resources from him to have evident in our lives allows us to be a, the standard of love is set by the example of the, of the love of Christ, Christ's love. Well, you shouldn't be looking down the row and saying, well, I'm, I love people more than they do. I'm okay. <laughs> right? You should be looking at Jesus. Right? It's not, it's not looking down and so, you know what? I'm ahead of that person and that person. Well, I might be able to catch up to that one a little bit, but I'm ahead of that whole row. So, you know what? On the, sca- on the curves, grading on the curve, uh, you know, I, I got a B plus. I'm okay. That's not the way it works. The standard for us is the example of Christ. And you could, you know, and, and here are some of the things you just, you know, just, just the things that run through my mind and heart as I'm asking these kind of questions that that means that our love somehow or another means that we befriend the unlovable. That we're the guy who looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, everybody in the world hates you, but come down, I'm going to have lunch with you today. Somewhere along the line, it has to get to that point. It, it, it has to, somehow or another, it has to cross barriers. Those barriers can come on all different shapes and sizes, but somewhere along the line, there has to be somebody who looks at the Samaritan woman at the well and starts talking to her. And if you don't know all the backstory about that, ask me in the, in the lobby over there. Right? It, 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 there's a sense where, where we just have to be forgiving and understanding and patient. And, and you know, it, and the one that, that I would hold up is like with Peter's denial, right? He denies Christ three times, even though he's the biggest one saying, I'm never going to let you down. All the rest of these guys made me, made me scumbags, but I'm not going to let you And then he fails. And Jesus forgives. And you could just keep going all the way down through the line. Secondly, loving other people as Christ loved them never can contradict our love for Christ. Let me me say that again. Loving other people the way Christ loved them cannot contradict our love for Christ. For Christ. Somehow or another, our love for other people cannot lead us to disobey who God has asked us to be and what God has shown us is truth. And, and, and I, I think that's a, a, an issue that all of us need to be aware of today. It, uh, you know, it's just, th- there's a lot of conversation going on in our culture today of what it really means to love and respect other people. And, and the challenge that we as the church are wrestling, being confronted with is the conversation is going to say, shifting from saying, our love and our respect is, I celebrate who you are, and I respect that, meaning that you are made in the image of God, and you matter to him, and you are priceless and valuable, and et cetera. The conversation is now is going beyond that to say, but you also affirm everything I believe and everything that I do. And sometimes that takes us into places we can't go because of what God has showed us is truth and the commands that he's asked us to have. And, and so that gets to be very challenging for us. And I got to tell you, if, you if, if any of us think we are walking that fine line without really thinking and praying and studying, then we're probably not walking that line very well because those two things cannot go together. And yet we indeed can be people who are known for love even though we stand in obedience to Christ. Perfect picture. I'm going to take 
John chapter 8. Just a few two things, but some of you know the story. It's actually not, in, so you're going to have some brackets and a lot of Bibles because some early versions of the Bible have the story, others don't. The accuracy of it, I have no doubt about it. Whether or not it was actually in the original copy of John, we can have a conversation. But this is a woman who was caught in adultery. Many of you know that story. You know, the Pharisees grab a woman who was caught in adultery, they drag him to Jesus, and they say, hey, listen, this woman was caught in adultery, we got all the evidence, it's, it's airtight, etc. The law says we're supposed to stone her. What do you want us to do? And they're trying to trip him up. Why? Because he knows that he is loving, right? And he's forgiving, and he's merciful and compassionate. Say, so, you know what, we're going to trip him up, he's going to do something. Again. And so, and Jesus, at the beginning, he doesn't, he doesn't answer, he just kneels down. And he starts just writing in the dirt. We don't know what he was writing. Speculation that I most resonate with is that he's slowly writing out the Ten Commandments. And in, the, in those kinds of things. And so he stands up, and when they press him and say, you got, hey, you got to give it he stands up, you know what? Those of you who are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he gets back down on his knee, doesn't look at anything, he's writing, and slowly, one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away. And eventually, he looks up at the woman, and he says, where is everybody? And she said, they've all gone. And this is, and, and his response is, is, is the thing that must resonate in the heart of God's people if we're going to, if we're going to, if we are going to live out his love in the world. He said, neither do I condemn you. Celebrates who they are. But he says, but go and sin no more. What you do and think isn't necessarily in alignment, but I celebrate who you are because you matter to God. But he said, go and sin no more. That really needs to be our heart and mind and soul as we go forward. A couple of other points real quickly. When you and I obey God, our capacity to love other people grows. So if you don't want to like people, don't worry, don't worry about loving God, right? Because that, but if, if, I tell you what, if, if, if you obey God, he's going to reveal more of himself to you. Your love for him is going to grow. Your joy is going to grow. And all of that is going to make you a more loving person. It just is. That, that's, the, that's the outflow of it, right? He's going to reveal himself to those who say, if we're going to remain as a joy, it's going to be fruitfulness. All that stuff's going to come. Last point. Love. Genuine Christian love that follows the example of Christ has a tremendous evangelistic power. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. Let me wrap up with just these comments. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. It takes faith in Christ as your personal Savior and Lord to know the love of God. It takes faith in your daily walk to remain in the love of God. Let's be a people of faith. Let's pray together. God, thanks for your word today. And Father, what I would ask is keep the conversation going. Whether it's between a parent and a child, whether it's between spouses, whether it's just a dialogue we have between our own hearts and your mind and spirit. Keep the conversation going. Father, because we want to remain in your love and for our joy to be full as we love like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude our service with a final word.